your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. Lead us by still waters into mercy. Nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. your presence we long for. <laughs> we celebrate you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, what amazing grace you've just, you have given to your people. We worship you, Jesus, for everything you've done and continue to do. <laughs> continue to work in us, Lord, as your people. Thank you, Lord. We welcome you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Cobb Vineyard. So glad to see y'all here this morning. Would y'all please stand with us as we continue to worship God and um, sing about his grace and um, just his goodness this morning. Amen. Who 
breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing.
sing that again. worries in our hopes and dreams you have always been there and you will always be the God who's gone before us the God who never leaves so how do we forget that you are all our rest Jesus we relent Thank you for your presence. Breathe in. Sing out. Oh, my soul, remember your healing. our faith so what else could we do but turn to worship you breathe in sing out oh my soul
Jesus, we worship you, we welcome you. King of kings and Lord of lords. Worthy are you in this place, God. Worthy are you in all the heavens and in all the earth. Jesus, that you would make it possible for us to dwell with you to bask in your presence. God, there's no greater gift than your grace, than your presence. Jesus says, your people, we just ask for more, for more of your presence in our lives, more of your grace, God. As your people, we just declare it in our hearts that this place, this time, Lord, give us more, more of who you are, of all that you have, Lord. We say yes to you, God. Yes. Our souls cry out, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. More of you, Jesus. Spirit, dwell here among us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we continue to worship this morning, we're going to remember him by taking the elements. As I'm speaking, feel free to come up to the front and grab these little cups with tabs of bread on top. Um, Hold on to them. We're going to take them together. If you're joining us from Facebook this morning, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, Grab whatever's available to you. We're going to take it together. continue to bask in your presence and say thank you. Lord, the reason we're able to do that is because of what you did on the cross. So as this bread represents your broken body that was broken for mankind unjustly, Lord, it was not your punishment to bear and yet you bore it. Remember your broken body and say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Let's take the bread together. And Jesus, this cup that represents your blood that was was perfect, Lord. You were without sin. You were perfect in all of your ways. 
and you died a sinner's death. But Lord, you didn't stay that way. <laughs> you defeated death and you came back. <laughs> death could not hold you down. And for that, Lord, <laughs> what can we say other than you're amazing? <laughs> you're glorious. Thank you. And we remember your sacrifice and that you rose again. Let's take the cup together. if you're able to stand as we continue to worship this morning.
And all my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. Yes, you have. With every breath that I am able, I will sing the goodness. Sing it again. Bless your name. We we thank you for your presence. Lord, just continue to bless us with your presence. Lord, where you go, we want to go. Where you stay, we want to stay. Lord, wherever it is that you are, we want to be there as well. So, Lord, be with us, lead us, guide us, form us, shape us, mold us as people after your presence. Write this truth upon the tablet of our hearts, God. Let us keep it and be near to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen. 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 Let's just give a clap for the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is awesome to see you here today. Pray the Lord blesses you as we gather together to worship and enjoy His presence. I'd like to invite you to do something for us, if you would, and that is to take a moment and fill out one of our Connect cards. Uh, it is a card that looks like this. It should be in the chair rack in front of you. If you would be so kind as to take a moment and fill this out, and it's something that we uh, appreciate and ask uh, every person to do every week, and so it's very, very helpful for us. Obviously, there's a place for prayer requests. If there's something going on that you'd like for us to be joining with you in praying, we'd love to know about that. You can mark that on here. Uh, if there's something you're celebrating, we'd love to know about that as well. Uh, you can put it on here. If you're watching online, you can go to cobvineyard.com, click on Connect card, and it'll bring up something that looks very similar to what you see on your screen, and you'll be able to fill that out, and that would be an awesome, awesome, awesome thing. Uh, a few things that are going on, excuse me while I do some housekeeping, um, a few things that are going on to let you know about, Brittany will love me for that. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, if you have a child sixth grade through uh, senior in high school, Camp Vineyard is uh, still open. Registration is still available. They have, I, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 kids that have registered so far, but we would uh, love for you to, to be a part of that. Uh, if you go to campvineyard.com, it'll give you the details as far as how to go about registering if you have a child in that age group. Sixth grade through senior, I uh, love for you to participate. It's uh, an incredible week in June. 
uh, and I'd love for you to, to be a part of that. Uh, second thing I wanted to make sure you were aware of is this coming Friday evening is our time for prayer. And uh, we gather the second and fourth Fridays each month uh, from 7 to 8 in the upper room, which is on the back side of the building. I'd uh, love for you to come and join with us as we pray and cry out to God. We really do believe in prayer. We believe that God hears prayers. We believe that God responds to the prayers of his people. Uh, you know, Jesus or uh, James said, he said, you have not because you ask not. And I've always thought in terms of, my gosh, there's lots of reasons for us not to have, but let's not let it be because we didn't ask, you know. And so I uh, would love for you to, to join with us uh, from 7 to 8 this coming Friday evening. It will be a great, great time. Another thing that we're really excited about that we're launching uh, is a uh, new ministry, a care ministry. And to give you a little bit of an idea and an introduction to what it's about, check this out. There are folks within the church that encounter difficulties. They have struggles, and sometimes those struggles, those needs go unmet. And it's not because anybody doesn't want to help. It basically has more to do with somebody doesn't know that there's a need, or they don't know how to help. And it's our desire to create a way to make connection between those that need help and those that want to help. So that's what I would like to see our new care ministry do. Well, to begin with, it's our hope to provide help with meals if somebody's in need, um, come alongside somebody in loss, maybe with prayer cards, meals also. Um, I mean, personally, when I lost my dad during COVID, one of the hardest things I had to do because of the times is I had to write his obituary. So that's a practical way to help, but it might not be something that somebody thinks of. I can write somebody's obituary because I don't want anybody to go through what I went through. And possibly we can help with transportation. I recently was in need of transportation to and from a doctor's appointment. And somebody stepped in and took me to and from. And I may never need that again, but it was one of the most phenomenal things at the time that I could reach out and ask for. Small groups step in and they do great. But not everybody can be in a small group for whatever reason. And also there are times that a small group itself is going to need support with something. So that's why we want to come alongside in any way that we can. So it's just our hope that we can do some practical things. And then as the ministry grows, what we do and what we can offer can grow with it. So today, if you think this is something that you would like to be a part of, write on your Connect card that you'd like to be involved. You can put it in the offering basket or you can fill it out online. We will also have a informational meeting on March 27th, just after service. And it'll only be 15, 20 minutes. Um, after that, once we get up and running, people with a need can fill out a Connect card and we can begin to do that connection. And I want to read this because Thomas said it recently in service, and this is basically what this is all about. It says, one of the great glories of a church, not that we can come in and impress each other with how good things are going, but we can raise our hand and say, I'm suffering. I need help. I need somebody that can come alongside me and walk with me. And that's what Care Ministry is about. It's about serving. It's about being served. It's about coming alongside each other. And it's about doing life together in a very, very practical way. Awesome. Amen. Awesome. So again, you can use the Connect card to indicate, hey, I, I want more information about that. I'd like to come to the meeting or whatever. Um, and then just hold on to your connect cards. Like Suzanne was saying, you can, um, at the conclusion of our time together, we'll be receiving an offering you can put it in the offering basket. That would be a great, great thing. So um, uh, we'd love to have as many as possible that uh, would like to be a part, a part of this incredible, incredible ministry that's launching. So awesome. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, we are 
uh, blasting our way through the book of Acts. We are at Acts 17. It has only taken us a year and a half to get here, and uh, just, actually, it's not quite been that long, but, uh, but anyway, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 is a, 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 a very phenomenal passage of Scripture, it really is a transition kind of passage, um, and uh, what it shows is Paul and his group traveling through on his second missionary journey, and they are uh, in the process of moving into and through Europe, uh, particular Macedonia, Greece kind of area, and they are, um, I have to tell you all this, but I heard this terrible joke, you know. People, people get really upset when they find out that French fries weren't first cooked in France. You know what, what they were first cooked? In Greece. <laughs> you can write that down? No, I'm just kidding. Um, just came to me. I thought it was the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but anyway, they were working their way, like I say, through Macedonia, Greece. Uh, and it's interesting because um, uh, the first two stories, uh, Paul in Thessalonica and then in Berea, uh, it really tells stories of how he uh, is going to the synagogues, all that kind of stuff. Uh, when we get towards the end of uh, chapter 17, uh, we see Paul in Athens, which is a totally, totally different environment, culture, and he approaches it differently. So, uh, so we're going to leave Athens for next week. We're going to look at that next week. Uh, but today I want to start by looking uh, in Acts chapter 17, and we'll start in verse 1. One thing that I wanted to begin with asking is, what kind of people go to church? What kind of people go to church? Because this passage of Scripture talks about that. It talks about the different kinds of people. No, it doesn't enumerate it like that. But it's interesting, based on the response of people to the message of, that Paul preaches, there, there's a real distinction uh, in where people are coming from. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 1 begins this way. It says, When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And, you know, Luke in his writing is just sort of telling this story, it makes it sound like, you know, uh, one morning they were walking through and they went by this street and that street. These towns are actually like 30 miles apart. This is about 100 miles that's covered. It's probably not done in a day, I would not think, since they were probably on foot. Um, so, you know, it took a while. But anyway, he presents it that way. But they come to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue, as was his custom. And we talked a little bit about this last week, that Paul's normal way of going about doing evangelism is when he would come into a town, he would first look for a synagogue. He would look for where uh, the Jewish people would be gathered together. Sometimes uh, that was available. Sometimes, like in Philippi, there wasn't a synagogue, and he'd try to find a place of prayer, that kind of thing. But it says, as was his custom. This is what he normally did. As was his custom... Paul went into the synagogue, and on uh, three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. So he goes into the synagogue, and on, on several different Saturdays, as they are gathered together each week, he, he takes out the Scriptures, and he reasons with them. He, he teaches them from the Old Testament Scriptures of what Jesus, what the Messiah was to look like. What, what, how was he supposed to present himself? What would it look like when he came? What would happen to him while he was here? And he, he spoke to them and would tell them, this is what it says. This is what happened with Jesus of Nazareth, can you see he is the Messiah? Now, one thing that's very interesting that Don Curtis shared with me that I, uh, just helped open up the scripture to me is simply this. In the first century, there were really kind of two schools of thought about the Messiah. Uh, they, they, they thought of him, uh, there was one school of thought that said he has been David, which means son of David. 
And there's another thought that, that said, yeah, that, no, he's been Joseph. He's the son of Joseph. And, and the son of David, they thought of him as the conquering king. He was coming to establish his throne. He was going to move in in power. And, and, and so they would talk about this, this reigning king that is coming. But, but others said, no, 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 it's obvious when you read Isaiah 53. No, he's coming as the suffering servant. He is, he is, he is a, a suffering servant that is coming in. And, and there were two schools of thoughts. And what Don was telling me is there wasn't anybody that was really trying to marry those two. They weren't trying to bring them together. You were in one camp or you were in the other camp. And so here we see uh, uh, Paul communicating to them. And it says, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. So what he was doing uh, as they were gathered together, he was communicating to them about this suffering uh, servant. He was, he was going to passages like Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. And he was talking about the, the difficulties and the challenges that, that the Messiah would have. And how he would undergird and come in, underneath and he would... He would die on behalf of, and, and he communicated those kinds of things. And it says, explaining and proving the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Now, I want you to, to think about what I was just saying about the two schools of thoughts, and we'll come back to it in just a moment. In verse 4, it says, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So it says, some of the Jews... A, a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a few prominent women all responded. Now, how is it that, that all of these people would come in, they would hear the same message, and yet, yet only, only some of the Jews would respond, others uh, would respond more? I, I submit to you, it required an intentional listening ear. It required people who were leaning in uh, with their hearts open to hear the message that was being preached. It was, it was people who were hungry and eager to receive what it was that was being communicated, because I I submit to you, there are different types of people that go to church. There are different types of people. People come in to a setting like this, a synagogue like that. They, they come in and they have different mindsets. They, they come in, in in different positions. Some people, you know, especially, uh, it's interesting to me where it says that some of the Jews, it gives the, uh, the indication that there wasn't, there wasn't a ton of them that they came about. There was, there was some, but it wasn't, it wasn't the majority or anything like that. And, and, and I think that that makes good sense to me because I realize that there's a lot of people that come to church week after week after week, and they come because they have a family history that that's what you do. If you're going to be a good person, you get up, you get your butt to church on Sunday morning. You know, you get up and you get there. And, and you, may, you may get there and, and, you know, they may sing the songs and you're kind of like, oh, well, whatever, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, some weird guy gets up there and starts talking. And, and all of a sudden you remember to yourself, oh, man, large madness is going on. I wonder how the games are going you know, and you, and you say, oh, a number 12 beat a five last night. I wonder if there's been any other upsets, you know, and you start thinking and looking through that, and then you start thinking, man, I'm glad that basketball doesn't rain out like baseball. I wonder what the weather is going to be like. I, I haven't looked at the weather. Wow, it looks like it's going to be nice. I can go to the lake. I wonder, I need a new boat. I wonder what kind of boats are available, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden the worship team comes back up, and you're thinking, Wow, it's almost over. Church was great today. That was awesome, you know? Because, because we, we, are, we are doing something and we're just kind of going through the motions and we're just functioning and it's just what we do. And we get done and we check the box and we feel good about ourselves because we've been conditioned. That's what you do. If you're going to be a good person, that's just what you do. You go and do that. Now, uh, it, it reminds me of a, 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 a scene that I saw from... Andy Griffith, of all places, but they had a church service going on, if y'all are familiar with Andy Griffith, Barney, who was the uh, resident deputy, um, he was sitting in church, and the guy started talking, and about the first second the guy started talking, Barney fell asleep. I mean, he was out, and the guy was talking about, you'll love this, he was talking about how uh, uh, life had become too fast in Mayberry. 
It was just things were happening too fast. We needed to slow down and, you know, this kind of stuff. And, and so finally he got finished and said, amen. And Barney woke up and came walking by the preacher at the end of it. And he was walking out the door and he said, excellent sermon, preacher. That was excellent. He said, that's one thing you can't talk too much about, sin. <laughs> the guy looked at him, sin? I didn't talk about sin. I didn't. He, he just figured he's in church. That's what they're going to talk about at some point, you know? But, but isn't that the way a lot of times we do church? We don't, we don't engage with it. We don't really think that much about it. It just, sort of, it just sort of goes around. We check the box and we leave, and our lives are not impacted in any way because we've been there. Because our ears aren't open. We're not intentionally listening to what it is that God is trying to say. We have, we have a whole other set of people that they have a family tradition that goes to church, and yet there's still a hunger in their heart that says, I want to connect with God. I want to hear what God's saying. I want to hear what's in God's heart. And there's, a, there's an eagerness, and there's a yearning, and there's, a, there, there's a, a, a wanting to connect with God and to hear. And, and, so, and so it's not a bad thing to have a family tradition of going to church. The question is, where is your heart in it? Where is your heart in it? Are, are you still hungering to hear from God? Are you still hungering to connect with God? Or is it a box that you check off so that when you go home, you can feel good about yourself because you were taught to feel guilty if you didn't make it? And y'all know what I'm talking about. But there's another group here, and, and, I, and I, think, I think that some of those people are kind of represented in this story. There, there's some of the Jews that responded. Many of the Jews didn't. In fact, we're going to see how they responded in just a minute, but, but there was another group. It was, there was uh, Greeks that were there. Now, you have to know the Greeks would not have a family tradition of going, a family history of going to synagogue, probably. It was probably a relatively new event. But somehow or another, they had come into this thing. They wanted to hear more and more about this, about this, uh, this uh, monotheistic God. You know, they've been raised in this environment where everything's a God. There's a God for everything. There's thousands of these things. Uh, but no, all of a sudden, somebody comes in and says, no, 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 there's one. There's one God that reigns over everything. And they were, they were drawn to that message and they wanted to hear and they learned. And, and so they would come into that setting with a, with a hunger and a thirst. And so it, it doesn't surprise me where it says some Jews and many of the Greeks because there was a, a hunger, a yearning. And so, and so I just, as we, as we blast by this this morning, I just want to challenge you to ask yourself, which one am I? Which one am I? And if you're, if you're in the first group, I invite you to an opportunity to repent, to say, God, change my heart. Don't let me, don't let me grow cold to the things of God. Don't let me grow cold to a yearning and a hunger and a thirst for you. Don't, don't let my heart become, become a, a place of stone, Lord, that I just come in and go out and I, I don't ever look to encounter the living God. God, awaken something within me. Awaken my heart, oh God, that I would, I would hunger and thirst, that I would, I would sit, that I would intentionally listen for you. I would look for you at every turn. God, awaken us. So it goes on and says, uh, some of the Jews were persuaded, joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But it says, but other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. I love this, or, or, or I'm saddened by it, where he, he doesn't say many of the Jews did not agree with the message. He didn't have anything to do with the message. I submit to you they probably didn't even hear the message because they weren't listening for it. All they knew is here they were 
you know, kind of had this nice little group going and all of a sudden these hooligans, Paul and his guys show up and all of a sudden a lot of the people are, are out following somebody else. And they, all of a sudden, I, I don't think it had anything to do with theology. It had everything to do with prestige and power and authority in people's lives. There was this, this place where all of a sudden they were being usurped. Their, their, their span of influence was being pulled away. That was being uh, distracted and, and taken from them. Their objection, objection to the gospel wasn't theological, but it was cultural and political. And so it says in verse 5, they rushed to J uh, Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. I love it. I, I think it's the King James that translated, uh, these men that have turned the world upside down have come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Well, wait a minute. Was, wasn't Paul teaching them that the Messiah would have to suffer and, and be raised from the dead? Yes, absolutely was. He was, he was of that school. But here they're saying what he is declaring is that there's a king and his name is Jesus. Well, what, what, what? Isn't, that, isn't that this other school? Absolutely. See, what Paul was doing was marrying the two and saying, no, 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 the Messiah is both. He is a suffering servant and a reigning king. And, and, and as, as strange as that sounds, it all comes together in the person of Jesus. Now, wouldn't you love to, you know, to have the cops pull up at your house and say, Thomas, I'm afraid you're under arrest. And I'd say, what did I do? They said, the way we hear it tell, you've gone around the world and turned it upside down for God. Not only that, but you're proclaiming Jesus is king. Not many of us get arrested for that. But sadly, I don't know if you would in our culture, but sadly, it's, it's like the old saying that said, if you got arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were arrested for that, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That you're turning the world upside down, proclaiming Jesus is king? You know, you, you have to feel for Jason in this story. I don't want to spend any time on him, but you have to feel for this poor guy. He opens up his home to these guys, and all of a sudden he's arrested, and, and it goes on, and he has to post bail, it says. Um, it says, when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. So, so here we have the beginning of this church in Thessalonica, as, as there's all this chaos that's going on. Verse 10, it says this, As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. <laughs> and I just, at some point, you have to say, Hey, Paul, hey, listen, dude, do you notice a pattern here? You go to town, you go to the synagogue, you get in trouble. You go to town, you go to the synagogue, you get in trouble. There's a, there's a repetitiveness here. But, but I submit to you that there was a relentlessness in the heart of Paul Amen. and of his team. There was a relentlessness that said, you know what? No matter what happens to me, I've got to share the gospel. That's why he says in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says, he, says, uh, he says, I am compelled to preach the gospel. Woe to me, he said, if I don't preach the gospel. If I don't, if I don't communicate to people. Because Paul was completely and totally 
captivated and completely and totally convinced that the only opportunity that any person had to be reconciled to God, the only opportunity that any person had to have peace with God was through the sacrifice of Jesus. He was convinced that there was no other opportunity. There was no other way. There was no other way that anybody could walk in a right relationship with with God himself except through the person of Jesus. He He was completely convinced that the purpose of life was to know him. That's why he said in Philippians, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, that I may know him, forgetting everything else, I count it all as dung, that I might grasp this one thing, that I may know him. The purpose of life is that I may know him. There's a people out there that has no idea that they can be reconciled to God. They can be brought to oneness with God. They can walk in right relationship with God, but it all happens through Jesus. And then there was, there was, there was a, a third thing that Paul understood. Paul understood that there was a coming judgment, that there was, there was an ultimate judgment that was coming, and the only opportunity to escape the coming judgment was through the person of Jesus, that his sacrifice on my behalf and on your behalf would pay the price, that we would not suffer the judgment of God. We could be delivered from that. We could walk in freedom. Paul was completely convinced all of that only came about when someone came into contact with Jesus. It only happened when people walked in right relationship with Jesus. It was only when they understood, when they submitted their lives, when they looked at him, they understood he was the king of glory. He was the king of all. And they gave their lives to him. That was the only way. And if he didn't tell them, who was going to? He was convinced. If he doesn't tell them, who was going to? See, in, in, in our world, we get thinking, oh, so-and-so will tell him. Maybe, maybe someone, oh, God, you know, send somebody to tell him. And God say, I already did. It's you. It's you that I've sent. That you can, you can communicate that people can be reconciled to God. They can have peace with God. They don't, they don't have to walk through life feeling like God's their enemy. They can walk in wholeness. So Paul goes back to the synagogue in Berea. He said, now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those of Thessalonica. You know, you just wonder if Luke ever visited Thessalonica after he wrote this. <laughs> you know, he, he would have been a hero in Berea, not so much in Thessalonica. It says, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scripture every day to see if what Paul said was true. In this, I really see how do we listen to a biblical message? How do we listen to a biblical message? When you come in here on a Sunday morning, when you, when you turn on a podcast, how is it that you, that you listen to that? And, and I, I love what it says about the Bereans here. First of all, it speaks of their eagerness. There was a, there was a hunger within them. There was, there was a yearning within them. They, they wanted to, to grow. They wanted to mature. They wanted to understand. They wanted, to, they wanted to, to, uh, to understand more fully what it meant to be in relationship with God, walk with God, live lives according to the Scriptures. How do I do that? There was a, an eagerness in their heart. There was a, a yearning uh, inside of them that they would, uh, that they would um, somehow or another connect with. I just encourage you, always, always, always be a learner. Always have the heart of a learner. Always have the heart that recognizes that you're not uh, the end-all, be-all. So many times, uh, you know, I hear people and they listen to a message and they listen to it as a critic. They're looking for all the points of, of the things that they disagree with. Oh, yeah, that's not, that, no, no. You know, and they just, they, it's like, no, 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 stop. Open your heart. Look for God in it. Look for God. What, what is God saying in this? What is God communicating? Open, open my ears. Don't listen as an expert. Don't listen as one who sits in judgment on, on every word. Come as a child with an, with an open heart 
that is pliable and teachable. I, I remember hearing a story. If, if you're not a theologian fan, this won't mean as much to you. There's a guy named Karl Barth who was a, uh, a Swiss theologian that uh, just phenomenal, phenomenal. In fact, in 1962, he was on the cover of Time magazine. He was very influential. Uh, and there was a, uh, um, uh, a, a seminary group that had an opportunity to question him. And, and so their, their one big question to him was simply this. What is the most profound truth that you've ever learned? They were thinking of Karl Barth. I mean, he, he could just... Re- he, he said, the most profound truth. He said, the most f- profound truth I've ever heard and I've ever learned is simply this. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. We, we get lost in so many things. God, help us to, to always have hearts that hunger and thirst, ears to hear, to listen and see what it is that your heart is saying to us. But it doesn't end there. I love that with the Bereans. It doesn't end there. It starts there. And I think with us, it should start there. There's this eagerness and yearning that starts there. But it says, but the, it says uh, that there was also this, this uh, a biblical filter. You know, they would take what they heard. And, and, and I love it the way the Scripture kind of presents it, that Paul goes in uh, to, the, to the synagogue meetings, which would have been on their Sabbath, which would have been on Saturday, that Paul would go in and he would present his stuff. And then it says, every day... They spent time going through the scriptures to see if what he said was actually true. So it wasn't that they're they're just, oh, isn't that so great? He said that so well. No, no, no. They were were hungering and eager to hear, but at the same time, they had this biblical commitment that says, is that that what the book says? Is it what the book says? Is Is that really what it communicates? They take what they heard and they filter it through the Bible. Can I tell you, that's how you listen to a biblical message. That's how you listen to somebody when they're preaching or teaching or whatever. You know, they, they stand up and they say this stuff. And, and if anybody says, oh, oh, so you're checking up on me, are you? I'd say, good, you need to. You need to. Is that what the book says? I encourage you every single week, keep what the book says that I say and, and throw the rest of it out. They, they had this commitment that said, we're going to be, we're going to look at the book. We're going to uh, use it as the filter. So let me finish the story. It says, as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent, check that out. Also, so as a result, many of them believed. Why? Because they were hungry. They were eager. It wasn't just some of them, like it had been in Thessalonica. It was many of them because they, they took the word, they hungered after it, and they uh, put it through the biblical filter to find out. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowd, stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, and then left the instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So Paul, it just seems like he is staying one step ahead of trouble. One step ahead of trouble. One step ahead of trouble. So what does that mean for us today? Let me just kind of summarize. First of all, I would challenge you. What kind of a church attender are you today? What kind of church attender are you today? Do you have that hunger, that yearning, that passion? Are you ready to check off the box and so you can move on with your day? Do you have, do you have ears that say, God, what are, you, what are you saying to me in this? Lord, let me, let me see. Is that true? What does the Bible say about that? Is that true? And if it's true, and it's the word of the Lord to you, then God, write it on my heart and change my life. Amen. Let's bow our heads. 
Jesus, that's our cry and our prayer. Lord, I, I, I say, God, deliver us, free us, Lord, from that, that thing that just has us going through the motions. Lord, cause us to be people who hunger and thirst to hear the voice of the Lord. Cause us to be people who hunger and thirst, oh God, to connect with you and your spirit as you are poured out in our lives. Help us, God. Help us to be discerning listeners. Help us to be eager, intentional listeners who are discerning. God, deliver us from from judgmentalism that just wants to say, well, they're not in my camp. Oh, they see things different. God, deliver us from that. Lord, help us. Help, give us ears, God. Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, Lord, from people in, in different camps in your family. Lord, that we would, that we would, uh, Lord, that we would see and understand what you're saying to us. And I thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So what do I do with what I just heard? What are, what are the next steps? First of all, uh, as always, I encourage you, if you have never given your life to Jesus, you've never said yes to him, I'd encourage you, become a follower of Jesus. Give your whole life to him. Understand he is the suffering servant and the reigning king. That, that, it's, that he's both. And he, he offers an opportunity for you to be reconciled to God through his death on the cross. He offers an opportunity for your life to be transformed by his life through you. He offers the opportunity for you to, to, to walk and escape the final judgment as the judgment that's due you is laid on him. If you've never said yes, you've never said, I'm all in. I want to give my whole life to Jesus. Today would be a great day to do that. It's a great day to take that step. In just a few minutes, we're going to invite people to come up for prayer. And uh, when that happens, I encourage you to step out and to come forward with them. Second thing I want to encourage you with is this week, I will ask God to develop an intentional listening ear in me. I will ask God to, to develop a listening, an intentional listening ear in me. God, that I would, I would be done with just showing up and checking a box. God, I, 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 want, I want to hear the voice of the Lord. I want my life to be changed. I want to I wanna be impacted. I don't want the story of the Messiah to come right into my room and me not even hear it and not even know it third thing I would say is this. This week, I will ask God to help me have the character of a Berean. God, plant that in me. Let the eagerness and the discipline to have a biblical filter do that in me. Change me, God. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we've come to the time where uh, we're going to receive an offering. And the way we do that is we have some folks that come up and, uh, and then they'll walk through uh, the room. So if y'all want to go ahead and come up, that'd be awesome. And I'm going to pray and then um, they'll walk through. And I just encourage you, um, you know, just wave your hand, flag them down. Remember, uh, put your cadet card in the baskets. That would be great as well. So Father, thank you for your goodness towards us. Lord, I thank you that we serve a God who speaks. We thank you that we, we serve a God who communicates. Lord, you speak through your word. You speak through your spirit. Lord, you're, you're constantly speaking. Lord, would you give us ears to hear? And Lord, would you bless this offering for the glory of your name? God, that your name would be made famous in our church, in our community, and in our world. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So these guys are going to walk through, like I said, just kind of get their attention. I know many of you participate in the offering in a lot of different ways. If you're watching online, uh, you can go to cobbvineyard.com, click on the donate button. You can give that way. You can write a check, uh, send it through snail mail. You can go to your uh, bank and click on uh, bill pay and they'll set it up and send it out for you. And 
many people give uh, in all of these ways, and we are so, so thankful for that. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, the worship team is going to lead us in a song, and then we'll have an opportunity for people to come up for prayer. So why don't we all stand? a passage, I believe, I believe it's in Luke. I'm not 100% sure of that. But it says what to me is such a strange thing in Jesus' ministry, but it says that the power of the Lord was present to heal. And I always thought, you know, Jesus was there. Of course it was. But there was something unique about that moment. And I, I just... I say that because I have a sense that the power of the Lord is present to heal. And so um, I just want to invite you this morning, if you're here and, and you're experiencing any physical something, injury, disease, whatever it is, I, I believe that the power of the Lord is present to heal. That he wants to touch you. So in just a couple of moments, we're going to invite people to come up. And I encourage you, don't, don't sit back and say, oh, wow, I hope uh, that's really good for somebody else. No, if there's something going on, allow the Lord to touch you. It's always an invitation. God gives a word of knowledge because it's an invitation. So I encourage you to respond to the invitation of the Lord. Second thing I sensed, 
um, was I, I feel like that there's someone who, who is here and you're having an issue with the foundation of your house. Water is getting into your house. Okay? And, and I, don't, I, I don't necessarily know that God is saying, so he wants to come and miraculously put a French drain in your house and heal it. I, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily think that's what he's saying. But I think that he is saying he wants, he wants to minister to you. And so... So, uh, again, as an invitation, if you've got an issue with the foundation of your house, I encourage you to respond to the Lord and come up and receive prayer and see what God will do. Amen. Amen. So we have uh, some ministry team folks. If y'all want to come up, uh, if you'd like prayer for any of these things or anything else, let me just invite you to step out from where you are and come up front and allow us to pray for you. And if you're coming... Uh, to pray for people, you can just have your back to the stage. If you're coming to receive prayer, you can just face towards the stage, and that'd be awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So we need several more prayer people. Would be awesome to come up. And there's people on either side of me. Would be great. Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the goodness of who you are. God, I pray that you would release the power of your kingdom. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that the, the power to heal would be released. Lord, in Jesus' name, that, Lord, that you would bring deliverance and freedom. And, uh, Lord, that you would set free from pain. Father, I, I thank you for my, my friends, my brothers, my sisters that are in this room, in this building, watching online. Lord, I pray that you would pour out the very blessings of God. Lord, that you would, that you would resurrect within us a, a hunger and thirst for the King of glory. Father, I pray that you would help us to see and understand and embrace the greatness of who you are and who you want to be in us and through us. I pray that would permeate all that we do and say. And I thank you for that, God. In Jesus' holy name. God bless you all. Thanks for being here. Have a great Sunday.